Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Equity Centered Practice and Suzuki Part One. My name is Felicia, and I'll be running everything in the background for our session today. We're thrilled to host today's webinar, and we're very glad you came to join us this weekend. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our presenter for today, Tiffany Rice. Tiffany is an avid musician, educator, and diversity, equity, inclusion practitioner. She currently works at the Buckingham Brown and Nichols School as the Middle School Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Global Education Practitioner. Prior to her time at BBNN, Rice held faculty and administrative roles at various schools in Massachusetts and South Carolina. The director of El Sistema at the Conservatory Lab Charter School, the performing arts director at the Windsor School, and the Carolina String Academy Program Coordinator at the Ashley Hall School. She also served on the violin faculty for intensive summer programs, such as the Oklahoma Summer Arts Institute and the Los Angeles Philharmonic's Yola National Festival. Passionate about string education and pedagogy, she holds a BME, MM, and Performer Diploma from the Indiana University Jacobs School of Music, where she studied violin and violin pedagogy. Tiffany completed her Suzuki teacher training at the Ithaca Suzuki Institute in 2008. Tiffany, thank you so much for being with us today. The floor is yours. All right, thank you so much. Um, good day, everyone. I know we're all zooming in from different time zones, so it's afternoon here in Boston, um, but I am so thrilled to be in this space with all of you. And before I get started, I want to say some some thank you, some gratitude for um, people bringing me here today. So um, to the people at Suzuki Association of the Americas, Angelica Cortez and Christy Felsing, thank you so much as well as members and partners at the Alfred Music <clears throat> organization, Felicia Elenum, Heather Meyer, Danae Witter, and our translators who are working very hard today as well, Susana Manjarez and Luis Dorado. And if I've missed anybody, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and thank you for your patience. You know, Zoom, it never le it's never dull, right? The, the joy of life theater, sometimes things work and sometimes things don't. So thank you everybody for your patience. And I'm glad that we are able to provide um, translations for people so they can access this information. Um, you've heard my bio, my, my journey to bringing me to this point is actually one that I'm excited about. And I love when I have opportunities to come where my my passion and love for DEI work and my passion for music get to you get to intersect, and that's what we'll get to do today. Um, we'll have opportunities for Q&A at the end, so feel free to put those questions in the chat so you don't forget about them, and then we'll have an opportunity to address them at the very end. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> okay. All right, here we go. So today's goals, um, we have three learning goals. We're going to understand the meaning of equity and its importance in music instruction. We're going to learn the meaning and importance of asset-based language and frameworks in music education. And we're going to begin to identify and reflect on barriers in, to equity in our programs and studios. So this is um, a part one of a two part session. So we'll focus on two equity practices today. And then in January, we'll have a chance to focus on um, two more additional uh, practices. So to get us all on the same page, we're gonna engage in a, criti a critical check-in. And a critical check-in, I'm adapting this from um, Dr. Liza Toulouson, who is uh, an educator, she's an author, and she's also an amazing DEI practitioner. She's the author of the book, The Identity Conscious Educator. And um, this is something that I've learned from her, we're gonna adapt this, but it's an opportunity for you to basically check in with yourself, right? It's a Saturday. How are you coming to the space? Um, it's an opportunity to put ideas on the table. And then it's also an opportunity to just to check in how you're feeling about the learning that's going to happen today. So I'm going to ask you four questions and I'm asking you to answer them on a, on a 10 point scale. One being not very, 10 being very. You can jot your questions down on a, in a notebook if you're taking notes. Um, if you feel so inclined, you can put them in the chat. Um, it's totally up to you, but we'll get started. I'll give you about 30 seconds or so to answer each question. So our first question, how present are you for this experience 
right now and why. So again, we're using a 10 point scale. One is not very, 10 is very. And if you feel comfortable, you can put your answer in the chat. Our next question is, how committed are you to developing and or maintaining sustainable equity practice and why? All right, we'll move to our third question. How prepared are you to engage in conversations about equitable practices with others and why? And then our final question. How comfortable are you with the discomfort and uncertainty that can come with discussions about equity and why? So I'm gonna take a peek in the chat while some of you are answering. Thank you for those who put some responses. Okay, I'm seeing a range. I'm seeing, ooh, I'm seeing some tens. This is exciting. Tens, eights. Very interested, but tired. I hear that. I hear that. And somebody off the scale 11, essential. That's exciting too. All right, great. I'm seeing some really encouraging responses. 10, it aligns with my personal and professional philosophy of education. This is great. I see some sixes. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your honesty. All right, some people saying I'm ready and I've been working on this for a while. All right, great. This is wonderful. <clears throat> so we are in a webinar format, so we will not necessarily be having discussions today, like we won't be interacting with each other, but I'm hopeful that, you know, the topics that we'll cover today will spark conversation that you can take back to your programs or with uh, members of your music teaching network. All right. Oops. There we go. And I always love to kick off um, sessions just by framing our work and grounding ourselves in a um, quote from Dr. Suzuki. Our aim needs to be the nurturing of children. The moment we rigidly convince ourselves education is what we're after, we warp a child's development. First foster the heart, then help the child acquire ability. This is indeed nature's proper way. And you can see that I have bolded specific words in this quote, nurturing of children, foster the heart. Um, and when I think about equity work and its importance, to me, if we're really committed to nurturing the whole child, it, equity work is the way to do that, right? Equity, giving every child what they need. And in order to nurture somebody, you need to know what their needs are to make sure that they're all being met. And then when we think about fostering the heart, when we really take the time to give the students what they need to be successful, they can show up as their authentic selves. And when they show up to a learning space or any space as their authentic self, the sky is the limit and, and their, their potential and their, their, um, their potential for success is, is really boundless. And so I just think that's important as we ground our work today. All right, and just to make sure we're on the same page, you know, we're talking a lot about equity. I would love to make sure, like, just to see where we are with our definitions of equity versus equality. So let's start with the word equity. And I would love for you to just toss in the chat, what are the first words that come to mind when you hear the word equity? Maybe you have your own working definition. Maybe you think of some keywords. If you feel comfortable, please drop that in the chat. So let's, let's look for equity first. All right, needs of all are met. Great, thank you. Helping every student as they are individually, all access equally. Yeah, great. Let's see if the equal for all. All right, all right. Great, thank you. Now let's take a look at um, the word equality. Same thing. 
in the chat, please feel free to put what, what words come to mind when you think about equality. Maybe what's your working definition for either yourself or your program. So I'm seeing everybody gets the same, okay? Mm -hmm. Equ equity, all right. Treating everyone equally, okay? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for those that are dropping in or dropping your answers in the chat. I'm going to just move to our next diagram and you can keep those. Um, you can keep entering things in the chat if you'd like, but uh, here we have a diagram and I'm just going to just describe what's there just in case some people, you know, I've, I've tuned in in the car before, so maybe you're not able to actually look. Um, but what we have is a diagram and on the diagram, we have two trees. We have a tree on the left. We have a tree on the right. And the tree has multiple branches and on the lowest branch there are three pieces of red fruit that are on the lowest branch and i'm i'm gonna assume that they're apples but maybe i shouldn't assume and under each tree we have three people there is a person who is taller in height we have a person who is average in height and then we have a person who is sh um, shorter in height so on the tree to the left um, the person, all three individuals are standing on the same size crate. So we have the tallest individual, therefore, who's able to reach the piece of fruit from the lowest branch. The medium sized person just shy of the of the branch so isn't able to reach the fruit. And then the smallest person is not able to reach at all. And then on the right side of the diagram, we see same tree, mirror image of the tree, right? Lowest branch has three pieces of fruit. Same three individuals, same, same height range. We have the tallest individual, we have the uh, medium-sized individual, and then we have the shortest individual. And the difference is they all have crates that are different sizes. So the, the tallest individual has the shortest crate. The medium-sized person has a medium-sized crate. And the shortest individual has the tallest crate. And as a result, all three individuals are able to reach the fruit easily. And so when we think about what is equity versus equality, this diagram illustrates it really, really beautifully. Equity is about giving everybody the tools and supports that they need to achieve a goal. And an important part that often gets left out of that is the removal of barriers to doing that. So what are like removing barriers that keep people from access to the tools and support versus equality, which is about everybody getting the same, right? So it doesn't matter where you are, what your needs are, you all kind of are given the same toolbox and you're expected to use that toolbox to be able to reach the same goal. And when we think about equality, you know, people think like fairness, well, everybody gets the same thing and that's coming from a very neutral standpoint. Whereas we have to remember, right? Why is equity important? It's because we're all different. We are all different. Everybody on this call is different. We all have different needs. And especially when we think about our learners in our, in our studios and in our music programs, all of these students are coming to us and all these families are coming to us with a different set of needs. And so in order for us to really make sure that they can achieve the goals and that we, we want for them with ease, we have to give everybody it, the things that are individual to their circumstances. And how does equity relate to Suzuki's philosophy? Well, I think it ties in really beautifully, right? Every, every like we think um, about talent education, every child can succeed with, you know, X number of repetitions, or if they just do enough repetitions. And if we think again about the every child can dot, 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 provided that they have the resources and the support and the access to those to do so. So with that in mind, as we gear up to talk about our two equity practices, we were going to approach it like a practice session. So when you're getting ready to practice, it's important that you listen, right? We're going to listen today. When you go back to your studios and programs, you're going to listen to the needs of others to make sure that we are hearing from people rather than us assuming and, and kind of passing on our judgments on people. We're going to need encouragement, and that's an important one too. Um, equity work, whether you're developing your practice, whether you're sustaining your practice, it will come with some road bumps and it's not always easy. And so we need people in our, in our network to be able to encourage us and also to hold us accountable. And then last but not least, we've got to have that repetition, right? <laughs> got to do it over and over and over again to build that muscle. So with that in mind, we're going to move to our very first equity practice, which is talking about asset based language and mindset. Our words matter. 
Right. So when we're talking about asset based language and mindset, we're going beyond just like nice words. And when we think about what is it, asset based language is a language and a mindset that centers students strengths and their existing knowledge. So we're valuing what the students are coming coming to us with already. It's focusing on opportunity. So they're like anything that ha that a student has or any student uh, situation is an opportunity for growth. Um, it values diversity, and, and what I mean by diversity is diversity of thought, cultural, racial diversity, like diversity can encompass so many things, um, diversity of just like experience, intellectual experience, lived experience, all of that is viewed as a strength and not as something that's kind of holding them back. And then another important part of asset based language and mindset is just acknowledging how um, the connection between, you know, where students are with our systems in our society and acknowledging and naming that systems need changing. So rather than seeing a circumstance and kind of submitting blame on a student, it's understanding how the system has resulted in that. Um, why is it important? Well, asset based language is important because it improves student learning and outcomes you know, first and foremost. And it does that because it's helping to reshape the narrative or reframe the narrative. And it promotes a positive narrative about, narrative about students. And so if we have a positive narr narrative about students and they're hearing this positive language and they're feeling this positivity, they're more inclined to excel, right? And achieve and live up to that. And um, it negates the negative stereotypes that can live in, you know, th those are negative stereotypes, negative narratives that can um, be pervasive in a community, right? They can be in the ethos and students and families pick up on that and they kind of, you know, they kind of, it's like a self-fulfilled prophecy where they kind of live into that. And it's, it's almost like um, if you think about confirmation bias, like you're looking for behavior to confirm your beliefs. So if we believe that people have potential and we, we believe that people are coming to us with strengths, we're more inclined to see that in their work. And um, what does it look and sound like? It's important to understand that asset based language is more than just positive words and encouragement. Um, one of my favorite Suzuki resources is I have a sheet of paper that a colleague of mine at Ashley Hall gave me, which is the 100 ways to say good job. And I love I loved that sheet. I still love that sheet. And so it's like, great job. You're awesome. You know, you're doing great or you're almost there or, you know, keep keep going. You know, all these ways to encourage. But asset asset based language is really going deeper and it's really reframing how you think about somebody's um, the current skills and offerings that a, that a student has and when we think about the opposite opposite it's you know deficit based language and mindset where we're focusing on lack we're focusing on holes or, or um, deficits basically like st what students don't have and what they don't what they're missing and so when we shift to that asset based language we're really working towards um, an equitable practice and in thinking about this asset based language and thinking about our words and our mindset, we we can't talk about it without really talking about our biases. We all have biases. I have biases. Everybody does. Um, we all have implicit bias, and that's part of how our brain is wired to process information. And we you know we make associations, and we some associations are positive, some associations are negative. And what's important is that we become aware of what those biases are because they can play out in our words unintentionally, sometimes intentionally, but oftentimes it's unintentional. And so we have to treat our biases and, and working on those like oral hygiene. And this metaphor comes from a wonderful um, um, practitioner, Rosetta Lee, who equates it to oral hygiene. And so like, if you think about your, your biases like um, um, tonsils, right? Your tonsils are inflamed, they're irritating you, you go to the doctor, you're, they're infected, whatever. And the doctor says, okay, you've got to remove them. So let's imagine you discover like, oh, you know what? I have a bias towards X or a bias against Y. And so with your tonsils, like they're inflamed, they're bothering you, you remove them and then they're gone. They never bother you again. And some people like to think, maybe hopefully, you know, optimistically like, oh, my bias is the same way. I, I know I'm biased in this way and now I've addressed it and good, I'm done, super. <laughs> and unfortunately, 
That's not how that works. Um, addressing bias is an ongoing practice and it's like plaque, right? Plaque accumulates on our teeth every day. Every day we have to floss, every day we have to brush, we have to go for our routine dental visits. And that is what bias is like. And I go a step further too, um, like imagine that you're out to dinner with somebody or something and you've got a piece of food stuck in your teeth, a piece of spinach. And if you have that spinach in your teeth, would you want somebody to tell you or would you want to go through the whole conversation with a big piece of food there? I would like to, I would like to know. And so again, in working with our bias, it's important that we surround ourselves with people who will be able to call us in and name the bias so that we can work on it. All right. So I've got a scenario here for you. All right, just to get us thinking again about asset based language and I'll go ahead and read it for you and then give you just a few seconds to process. You teach cello in a community music program and a new cello student is joining the program mid year. The student has been playing for two years in his high school band, the only instrumental ensemble at the school. This child has received all of his cello instruction from the band teacher who has never taught string players before. The student auditions on a pop tune arrangement he learned in band class. It's clear that he enjoys playing, reads music well, and also needs a lot of support developing foundational technical skills and habits. During a faculty meeting, the cello teachers are discussing the student's private teacher and group class placement. One cello teacher questions whether or not this is the right program for this child. The teacher challenges the student's choice of audition piece and starts talking about how difficult and draining they find remedial teaching to be. The teacher is concerned about how to get this student caught up with the other cello players his age. Other teachers chime in and agree. And so I'm just going to give you a moment to let that marinate. If you're a visual person, go ahead and reread it. All right, so hopefully that has sunk in. Um, I've got some questions for us to talk about. All right, so we're gonna, we're, let's chat. We get another opportunity to put some things in the chat. Um, first question is what's coming up for you as you, as you read that, um, as you read that scenario? Is that something that, oops, sorry, oops. <laughs> I'm trying to find the chat again and I can't find it. Oh no. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah. So in the chat, what's coming up for you? Is this, are, are there things in that scenario that resonate for you? Are, do you have questions? Are you looking at that saying like, yeah, that sounds like a, a typical, typical meeting at my program. All right. Sounds like the teachers do not want to meet the student where they are. It feels more about the teacher's needs. Ah, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for sharing that. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Somebody's asking, what are the goals of the program? He's a child. We'll learn and adapt when given the chance. Yes. Agree. Yes. Agree. So we have a lot of a lot of agreement happening. Yes, this is a child, right? Um, absolutely. Teacher ego involved. <laughs> yes, I would definitely say that's the case. All right, let me close out the chat. Um, Great, thank you for that. Um, next question, where do you see deficit-based language and mindset in this scenario? Again, you can drop that answer in the chat. Ah, somebody wrote, you should never screen a student. They should all be accepted. Yeah, so um, any ideas of where you're seeing the Deficit-based language, yes, remedial. Yeah, it hurt to type that one in, <laughs> but I put it there. Um, conversation, conversation seems centered on how the student doesn't fit the program, exactly. And fit is such a tricky, tricky word. No thought given to the student why they are, why they are where they are, exactly. Only seeing the problems and not the self-starter, exactly, exactly, yeah. Good, thank you for these. Um, the question is how to catch them up to others. Absolutely. And I mean, you can do a raise a show of hands, but I, I feel like in every school and in every program I have taught in, this this idea of like we've got to catch kids up. When they come into our program, we've got to bring them up to speed. That is um that is really pervasive, at least in the school environments where I've been. Yeah. 
pop audition music as inferior. Great. Thank you, Glenda, for catching that. I put that in there as well. Yeah. Yes. Nothing wrong with presenting a pop song that takes ability. Absolutely. And what I've learned in my own work is like pop songs are hard. Those, those syncopated rhythms are not easy to learn. Um, yes. This reminds me of how newcomers are treated. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a, a great point too, when we think about programs that are really well established and you have kids that, you know, maybe started when they were five and they're kind of sailing along. When we bring new members of the community in, how are we talking about them? How are we making them feel welcome? Um, great, thank you. Um, and then let's move to the, the last question and the most important question. What asset-based language and framework can teachers use to talk about this new student instead? So how could we, how could we reframe that? Student is a good reader. Absolutely. Yeah. So seeing that as a strength. Anyone else? Student enthusiasm. Exactly. That'll take you really far. Yes. Yes. Looking at the, the enthusiasm, the, the musicality, the technical ability. What are strengths if, yeah, of the student? Exactly. Yes. Full of gatekeeping behaviors. Yes. Thank you. So can we can we start to think about yeah so if we're framing the student is motivated right right yeah and let's also note the students only been playing for two years and they've learned how to read they clearly are holding in the instrument and can play a pop tune like that's a big deal that's a big deal and what will they be able to do in this new environment yeah i'm seeing some really great responses thanks um i'm actually not able to keep up with the chat this is great this is great um and I, this scenario is grounded in a little bit of truth. Like I had to, you know, beef it up for, for a webinar. But um, I actually, in my first position at Ashley Hall, my first year teaching there, um, our school was partnering with a community music organization. And so about halfway through the school year, um, I received two new violin students. These were middle school kids who had been playing for about two or three years. And at the, they lived about an hour away in a really small town in South Carolina. And at their school, there was either chorus or band and they didn't want to sing. So they were in chorus, they were in the band and they were the only two violin players in the band. And similar situation, their teacher was not a string player, had never taught strings and, but saw that like these kids were so enthusiasm, enthusiastic, like their, their joy for music was off the charts. And so they came in their first lesson and I realized like they were really great readers. And what became very clear early on is they also devoured music. Like I would give them a piece to work on and they would come back and that thing was completely learned. Um, but as a result of having someone who is not a string educator, you know, they had some, some technical growth. Like they had some, for violin players in the house, you know, they had the locked wrist and, you know, the bow hold, some things to tweak on the bow hold that would, that were needed to be able to, you know, introduce more advanced techniques later on. And I, I had to think because I saw these like enthusiastic kids and they were best friends and like they just came with this amazing energy and were so excited every week. And I realized like I need to harness that energy and I need to harness the fact that they are amazing readers. So what I did is I rather than like taking them back to, you know, like Twinkle or Lightly Row or so, you know, a song like that. What I did is I collected a bunch of sheet music and every week I would give them a piece that I knew they could, they could read really easily and like feel good about and develop some confidence. And then I would do kind of the one point pra practice approach. And every week I would give them one technical element that they had to work on. So I was still um, honoring their love for music and the, the the desire to move through quickly, but also giving them the opportunity to focus on one thing at a time so that they felt like they could grow and it was reasonable, but they were still making progress in their own minds. And it it worked and it was it was um, a really beautiful thing. But I, again, I think about like the younger version of me would have absolutely brought them back and like done the open string thing. And you can do some of that too, but it's it's really a balance of how you frame that or thinking like, you know, oh, well, they're not, they're so old and they're, they're, we've got six-year-olds who are playing circles around them. Like that's not a mindset that's going to set these students up for success. And I see some things have popped into the chat and I'm going to check and see. Yes. Don't kill their enthusiasm and musical souls over technical needs. Thank you, Carol. Yes. 
Also imagine the knowledge the child could share with the others. Exactly, exactly, yes. And this, um, these particular students, this was new in the, 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 the growth of the program, so we didn't have fully formed group classes yet. However, they were amazing anchors when it came to music reading, and they were able to, you know, you could spread them out and they could help the students around them navigate um, the notation. So that is exactly what I did, and, and it, really, it really worked. And so that, to me, is always a reminder of thinking about the strengths that students bring when they, when they come to you. So thank you for that. I'm checking the time. I'm going to just move on to the next thing. As we're as we're thinking about asset based language, you know, on a on a broader scale, it's also important to ask ourselves some key questions. How do you talk about your students and families, um, particularly if you're in a in a teacher meeting? I've been, I've been in meetings where you know we're checking on student status to see how kids are, and that language can turn negative very very quickly and so are you in a position where you can set norms for how your meetings are run or you can set norms around how teachers talk about families maybe it's introducing sentence stems or it's always requiring that we you know list two strengths for every um, area of growth there are ways that we can put that in place so people can develop that practice um, how do you leverage the strengths of each student and each family um, a reminder of something that comes up for me here is um, I had a student that would like their fit like was just perpetually late to lessons like I just felt like they were always late they were after school always like five to seven minutes late and, you know I'm sitting there like gosh like I'm gonna run behind I've got students after this and they were always late and it could be really easy to jump to the conclusion of like they you know they don't care they're scattered and what I learned is that this particular parent was really involved in her community. So, you know, she's active in her church, she's active, you know, volunteering for nonprofits. And so it, rather than thinking of this like, oh, they are never on time, they're always making me run behind schedule, it's an opportunity, right? That's an opportunity for access to different parts of the community. So when you're recruiting, you've got somebody who's already plugged into your community who can start to bring new faces and new um, identities to your community and new voices. And then thinking also, this is a big question, what does a successful student look like in your program? Like as you think about asset-based language and what's valued, you know, we we have an image of what a successful student is in our program and whether we see the students or we just have ideals of our own, but we have to stop and think like, what do we value and what are we not valuing or not recognizing? And is there a way to shift that? And the answer is yes, <laughs> yes, there is a way to shift that. All right, um, great, thank you. So I'm just gonna pause for a little bit because I think our next one is our, is our second practice. So I'm just gonna let that soak in for a minute. If you've got things to put in the chat, you can. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna just move on to, whoops, here we go. Practice number two, I think I skipped a slide. There we go. Um, practice number two, which is think outside of the box creative thinking to remove barriers. So remember back when we were talking about the definition of equity, it's remembering that equity is removing barriers to give people access to tools and supports that they need. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, barriers that I had to think about and, and become aware of um, in some of the work that I've done. And so um, in no particular order, I'm just gonna put them all on the screen. In no particular order, I'm speaking specifically to um, my role at, at Ashley Hall and kind of developing this, this it's a, it was a modified Suzuki program that was happening in the context of a school. So we offered private lessons during the school day. That's when the bulk of the lessons happened. We had private lessons scheduled before school in the morning, and then we had private lessons that happened after school as well. And so, you know, it, it was, positive in many ways because we know like students have lots of after school commitment so this was an opportunity to make scheduling easier on families and it was also really important that this music was part of it was it was in the curriculum so that was a huge huge success and really valuable for the students in the community but going through that program and experiencing that and getting to know families, it became clear that we, we had some barriers that were coming through and, and they all kind of inform each other. Um, but one of them was accessible practice opportunities. Um, one of them was also family structure. 
and then the other one was socioeconomic status. And I, like I said, they're in no particular order and some of them feed off of each other, but I'll kind of start with family structure. So we're having, um, again, it's a modified Suzuki program. We have lessons for young students happening in the middle of the school day. We're encouraging families, you know, parents, guardians, caretakers to come and observe these lessons so they can take notes and help their child practice, right? So we're really trying to honor that part of the Suzuki method. And what we're realizing is that in doing that, we're really privileging those that um, either have the flexible work schedule where they can take time off of work and come to school and be at their child's lesson. We're privilege, privileging family structures where maybe there is one working parent and one parent who is not working. And what that means then instead is we have created a barrier to families that can't get the time off of work. And even in our after school scheduling, like if you have a lesson at 3.30, I mean, that's not the end of my work day. I know that's not the end of a lot of families work days. So even that is a challenge. And because then we're missing that piece of the parent connection, you know, a seven year old is wonderful, but they need adult support to be able to remember what they're doing at home. So then it became like, then we started recognizing like, huh, we need to think about opportunities for accessible practicing at home like what could that, that look like and again you know accessible practice for a seven-year-old is going to be different than it is for an 11 or a 12 year old than it is for like a 16 year old um and so what i started to do is i <laughs> i started to lean on technology and I'm, I'm very low tech so my 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 dipping my toe in technology was probably pretty pretty low <laughs> but um one of the things that i would do and this was for my young students this was for my you know more middle school age students and high school students is i would use the phone or use recordings so when if if, if you know some families could make it work right like i can come to one lesson a month and so in that lesson, I would have the family bring some sort of a recording device and I would outline, this is what we're going to be doing. This is our goal, like over, this is the arc of the, of the month. Here are the key skills and I want you to take pictures or take video of what that's going to look like. So when you get to that at home, you're able to, you, you remember and understand you're able to kind of guide the student in that way. With a, a middle school student that I had, this was before I was aware of what, um, um, voice memo was. <laughs> I had a flip phone for a very long time. Um, I had a student who used to, she had a device at home, I don't remember what it was, but she would send me audio clips via email. And she and then with, with like the subject, like, does this sound okay? And then I would write back and give her really like detailed information, like, okay, great, that was great. You're on the, you're on the right track, measure 11, make sure you check this, or in measure 13, double check the rhythm there. And then that set that student up to be able to um, make sure that she was practicing effectively, because what was happening is she was practicing, but she was practicing um, the, the wrong, you know, she wasn't practicing the correct rhythm or the correct note. So it helped her establish healthy, um, practice habits as well. And then socioeconomic status is on there as well, um, particularly to this, this institution. I don't know the, you know, the, the, the general financial makeup of the, of the, of the families there, but I would say mostly it was upper middle class and upper class students. And so we had a fee-based private lesson program and we, we had a lot of, um, per service teachers who were teaching hourly, they were getting paid per lesson. And we wanted to make sure that people were committing to the entire year. So what was happening is families had to pay for their entire year's worth of lessons, which was like 28 lessons up front. And so for families, you know, upper middle class families or upper class families, families who were in the financial place to be able to do that, like no problem, they would write the check, no problem, or bill their account, no biggie. Um, but what became clear as a, as a parent talked to me, just we were just having a conversation and I was like, why isn't your kid in our program? And they're like, I can't pay that check up front. And something as simple as being able to offer different payment plans for families, all of a sudden makes things accessible to people. So maybe they can't pay, you know, a couple thousand dollars up front, but we can make it an option to pay per semester or maybe pay by month. And offering that level of flexibility can really help remove barriers for families. Um, so I'm going to move forward and now I'm going to have you do a little bit of thinking. Again, let's chat. Um, first question, you can put this in the chat. You can jot this down in a journal if you're so inclined. What's coming up for you now? As you're hearing about, you know, me talking about family structure, um, accessible practicing, socioeconomic status, there, there are other barriers, like other things, but I'm, you know, curious what's coming up for you right now. And, um, 
You can put that in the chat. Great. All right, I do see a question that we will get to um, in the Q&A portion. Thank you for that. All right. All right, I don't see anything in the chat yet, so we'll keep going. All right, so um, what are some of the barriers in your programmer studio? And who's impacted by those barriers? And if maybe it's not clear, you're having trouble answering that question right now, maybe the fourth question can help you with that. Um, which, when you think about your ex existing policies and your existing systems, which identities are centered and are privileged with the way that those um, policies are playing out? That might help you realize what the barriers are. Like when you think about who's in your program and who's represented, what, what various identities are represented, are you noticing like, huh, we have a lot of this type of student or this type of learner or these types of families and not a lot of other types of families. Like think about how your policies and systems might be, might be playing a part in that. Let's check the chat. Big differences in family involvement and so support for students. Yes, yes. Yes, preparing students for virtual holiday program. I think, oh, I think I'm behind in the chat. Let's see here. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, the intersectionality is tricky. It is essential not to assume that socioeconomic status is tied to a specific group. Thank you, thank you, Zachary. Look at the demographic of your city to get information. And that is exactly right, exactly. And so my, with the socioeconomic piece, you know, some institutions, and I'm speaking about schools, is that, like they set it up where people have to come and ask you. And that brings up like shame and security of people having to like acknowledge, like that puts people in a place of vulnerability and, and it reinforces a power dynamic. So I'm all about transparency and offering that to people who need it or offering at least extending, like if you have questions and need to talk about anything, like please come to me. So it's opening the door for people to have that conversation. Um, somebody wrote, being online has helped me remove some barriers. I removed acoustic piano requirement and we can play on digitals. Yes, making it possible to play the piano for folks that don't have access. That's great. That is great. That is really great. Um, sorry, I'm missing some of these. They're coming in quickly, so I'm missing some of them. How scholarship families who would be great for the program and I still uh, and still make a living. Okay, thank you. Class schedule often clicked with other extracurricular activities. Yes, um, and I'm glad you brought that up because I was I was hoping to remember this. Like when you think about your policies, your systems, your schedule, and who that's privileging, I'm thinking about here. Like a lot of programs do the bulk of their lessons, their group classes, their musicianship and theory classes, chamber music, on a Saturday. Think about like in terms of um, religious identity, how that's impacting members of your community whether it's on a Saturday or Friday, you know, after school or Saturday or any, any type of weekend programming can really have an impact on that. And starting to think about the flexibility that you can offer so that that is still accessible to people no matter what um, religion or faith they practice. Um, let's see here, something I feel is pretty fundamental the baseline, the method repertoire. Mm -hmm. Folks are a limiting factor. Yes. So it seems to me that if you haven't read this, it seems to me that the Western Eurocentered cla Euro um, classical repertoire in the books are a limiting factor for student enthusiasm already. It seems to me that music teachers, folks who are themselves raised in classical repertoire, don't know how to teach folk pop blues. Yes, yes. And this limits the student's ability to reach to where their enthusiasm potential is. Big snap to Eve. Thank you so much for saying that. And I. I, I think that's such an important part, and that's one of the tricky things about um, you know about, about change. Like you have a program or a method like the Suzuki method that is so steeped in tradition, and they have such a well sequenced um, flow of repertoire. And at the same time, we have to acknowledge um, the students that are before us and acknowledge the the existing access to music and the their preference for music and the music that they're exposed to and how can we meet them meet them where they are rather than saying you need to come over here yeah yeah yes yes having a jehovah witness student put a stop to halloween event yep yeah, absolutely yeah um what happens when student 
when students plays better without parent involvement. Ah, that's a that's a different. I mean, that's another thing too. Sometimes you have to start to make that separation. Yep, that can happen. Great. Well, thank you for these responses. I'm going to keep moving because I'm seeing that our time is is coming. So as you're as you're starting to think about. Um, you know, think about what the barriers are, your policies. I have other questions for you too, like starting to think about action. What is one change that you could make tomorrow that requires little or no permission from anyone else? So when you, if, if you're running your own studio or if you're in a program, but you have a studio, thinking about your locus of control, are, are, there, are there changes that you could make just with you that could help remove barriers? You can put that in the chat or you can just think to yourself. And then thinking about what is one change that maybe that you want to make that may require support, more support. Who can give you that support? So starting to think like the first step is identifying what the barriers are because thinking that like, I don't have any barriers in my program. We, we all have a barrier, right? there's a barrier somewhere and then we can we can examine and talk with others to to make sure we're seeing it um, and then once you see it thinking about moving towards action so one thing somebody said is be flexible gear the needs to the students yes add rep that is representative of female co and composers of color yes and we're going to talk more about that um, in, in the, the next session yes having students feel seen in the repertoire that is that they're playing be prepared to teach a child with a variety of practice partners, perhaps no practice partner. Absolutely. Thank you. These are some great ideas. These are some great ideas. And, you know, the thinking doesn't have to stop here. So I'm hoping, like I said, I'm hoping that I'm lighting a little a little spark for you that will continue and you can have conversations in your in your local communities. Ask students for music ideas. Absolutely. Absolutely. One of my favorite things, it was a lot of work for me, but um, in an orchestra I used to conduct when I was um, at the Windsor School, we would do a student choice piece every semester. And so I would have students, I would do a Google form and I'd have students just put down like, what's a piece that you really would love to play in orchestra? And then we would put the list on the board and we would go through a democratic process where we would eventually like whittle this list down to three. And then we would all, you know, like through the, the election process, we would vote and, and then we would select a piece. And the, the enthusiasm and the buy-in, even if a student's piece didn't get chosen, just the idea that they had a say in it was so powerful. And, um, and they had a lot of fun. It was, it was a lot of fun. So yes, ask students what they want. Absolutely. Allow yourself to be vulnerable as a teacher. We are not all knowing. Thank you, Stephanie. Absolutely. I am not all knowing. I ask questions all the time. I do not claim to be the expert because this is ongoing work, right? Um, there's no finite end of that. You get a certificate and like, great, you have all the answers. So thank you for reminding us of that. Um, I'm going to move on to our next slide just as we put move things to a close. Again, I love to ground things in our Suzuki quotes. You don't have to practice every day, only on the days you eat. And that is the same with our equity practice, right? We, we only have to practice and work on equity on the days that we eat. So it's ongoing. We can't miss a day and we really can't miss an opportunity. And so I really encourage you to find a network of people that you that can support you in this work. And um, it, it makes it so much easier to do it with people, but if you're alone, you can do it alone too. Great. I invented a method for those who cannot keep bowing straight by left hand flat horizontally. Bowing straight by, okay, thumb vertical and student moves bow next to upraised thumb. Works like a bow guide. Oh, awesome, awesome. Thank you for that, yeah. I struggle with wanting to keep kids in the program by being more lenient with group class attendance practice and wanting to build with really committed students. Yes. And that is that is um, that is a, a rub too, right? Because obviously there is learning that's happening in the class. And so you want to offer the flexibility. And I think with, with situations like that, you want to be flexible. It's also un important to understand circumstances. Are there reasons why people are missing or people are coming late? And you can find out what those are and figure out how to work with families. Um, but yes, I, I um, that's with anything. Like if you're if you're not there, you're probably going to be missing out. So um, I, I understand that that is an ongoing question as well. All right, and then for our final just reflection, we can put this in the chat. 
Um, this is our head, heart, hand reflection. So um, you can feel free to answer all three. You can choose one that you wanna focus on, but for the head, what's on your mind right now? After having all this, like seeing all this information, doing some thinking, what is on your mind? For heart, what are you feeling right now? Maybe you're feeling affirmed, maybe you're feeling uncertain, maybe I've said something that didn't set well with you, so maybe you're feeling some discomfort. I would love to know. And for the hand, what action do you want to take right now? Like, what are you ready to do right now? So if you feel comfortable, please put your answers in the chat. You can also journal or just think about it in your head. Affirmed, I'm on the right track. Yeah, oh, somebody asked a great question. What are some networks we can plug into for DEI practitioners who are educators? Uh, there, I mean, oh gosh, there are so many. I would look at, um, I mean, like Alfred for, and, and you know, Suzuki Association of the Americas. I think more and more people are starting to, to merge these two. You may look locally to see if like some of your local music schools or some of the local school districts are offering DEI um, workshops for education. That's really, really important as well. And then this is an opportunity to start building networks. Like we're seeing where people are from and I'm hopeful that, you know, we can start to share like where we're from and, and stay in touch. That would be a really wonderful thing where we can start to de develop those networks here. Um, feeling comfortable with my direction in my studio. Um, Excellence is difficult. It has come from within. Okay. Great. What can I do to get more parent involvement when they are so, when they are too busy? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. I'm reflecting on my students right now. Great, thank you. And you can keep those responses coming in. I'm going to stop sharing my video because I think, um, we have hit the two o'clock mark. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Oh, I, wait, no, I'm not going to stop sharing quite yet because I wanted to say thank you and I wanted to share my contact information. Um, I just want to thank everybody for being here today, for your participation. The chat activity was great. Um, feel free to reach out um, at my email, timrice16 at gmail.com. Um, I welcome opportunities to connect with people. I'm still building my network, so I'm happy to connect with other music educators out there. I'll come back to the screen in just a moment, but I also feel like I want to show you the sources that I cited because this was not all of my original thinking. Um, so those are some of the, the graphics and some of the content from which I which I sourced. Then I'll go back to my my Gmail. So timrice16 at gmail.com. And um, I truly want to thank all of you for being here today. And um, Angelica, do we have time for some Q&A? A great question, Felicia. <laughs> maybe if you don't, if you uh, mind us continuing on, maybe you yeah, can just no, have at it. We got a delayed okay. start, so by all means, go for it. But let me just jump in in case those of you who are here in the audience need to leave right at the top of the hour. I want to say thank you so much, Tiffany, for your time today and for jumping in with us. Um, audience members, just know I know there's lots of comments happening in the chat, and there might be some questions that we haven't gotten to. Tiffany is coming back for a part two session with us. That will be January 7th, and we'll be sending out information about that, both from the Alfred email and from the Suzuki email lists. So keep an eye out for those. We have a whole bunch of Suzuki webinars planned after Tiffany's as well. So we'll have more information about all of those coming in the spring. I'm going to drop into the chat a couple of links for you. Uh, if for whatever reason those links don't work, I will also be emailing those out with the replay video later this week. And in there, you can find a certificate of attendance for attending today's session. So thank you again, everyone, for coming. I'm going to hand it back to Angelica and Tiffany for Q&A to finish out the session. And we hope you have a great weekend. All right. Thank you so much. Um, awesome. Thank you. I'm, I'm a little, I'm like, Stimulating yeah. that with the yeah, which, which, where do which I look? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> How about we start with this one, Tiffany? We'll start with the one that's in the QA. Yeah. And I'll read it just in case anyone missed it. Um, so I love this question. Is it inequitable to teach a student who is perpetually late 
how to be on time. So it really kind of comes down to that. That So how do we balance um, making adjustments for meeting the students' needs along with equity-centered practice? So really curious to hear your perspective on that. Tiff. Mm, that is a great question. And I feel like being at a middle school, that is what I do <laughs> <laughs> all day long. <laughs> That's what we're doing. <laughs> and so do I think it is inequitable? No, depending on how it's approached, right? So I, I see this, like you have to meet every student where they are and every student comes to you with um, on the spectrum of executive functioning skills. So I see this as a, like an executive functioning issue or, or topic. And so it's not inequitable, but it's important to understand why the lateness is happening. I think it can become, it can start to, to teeter to the inequitable and judgmental side when we assume it's because, oh, they're so scattered. Oh, they just don't care. And we start to assign reasons why they're coming rather than the student doesn't have the skills yet. Or this, the student maybe is just like, maybe the reason they, like the, the suggestions you mentioned about like packing the bag the night before, that is so helpful. I know of students <laughs> who like will go through this and they won't pack the bag. And you wanna know why they're not packing the bag? Because they're such an amazing artist that when they finished doing whatever they were supposed to do, they started doodling and that doodle became this amazing picture. So again, it's like t getting, understanding the full picture of a student, understanding what their needs are, and helping to meet those needs in a positive way, like seeing it as a strength. And so, and I think again, particularly at the at the age range, like everybody needs support and developing. Like I was not born on time, and I'm an adult, and I'm still late to things. So I need help with that. Um, so yeah, I think the <laughs> short answer is understanding the reasons why, and doing it in a way that honors the student. Because um, sometimes you, you just, again, there there's so many circumstances and we can't assume and understanding the circumstances to support that as well. Because what you might find out is they're perpetually late because, you know, they can't drive themselves yeah. <laughs> or they're perpetually late because they're they're taking public transportation. They have two transfers like that can slow you down. So just finding the time to understand what the reasons are and then working with them on the skills that are that are necessary. Right. Yeah. And I find too that I get real caught up in like binary thinking, right? They are on time or they are not on time. And yes. The moment to say, wait, where's that coming from? Uh, so mm -hmm. with you there. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then maybe we can just do one kind of final question, wrap up thought from you, Tiff, on um, sometimes to uh, we, I think, get a little bit um we feel alone in what we're doing. Uh, maybe uh, maybe we're working at a music school that isn't focused on equity-centered practice. Maybe our colleagues are telling us, you know, that exception is actually demeaning to what we're trying to do or what we're trying to accomplish. So do you have any advice for folks that are facing that? Uh, absolutely. And and I I have felt that way. 100%. And I think the advice is you are not alone. That's not advice, but you are not alone. We had a room full of people who showed up on a Saturday because they care about this. And for this room, that means there are so, hundreds, thousands more people who are thinking about this, who value this and recognize how important it is. And if you are feeling that way, I, like I said, reach out to me. I'm, if you just need, sometimes you just need a person to be able to be like, am I losing my mind here? Like, am I imagining this? Like you have to just check in and get a reality check. And that's really important. And I, I'm happy to be that person. If you can find somebody, um, I encourage you to go to conferences just to, to network. I think one of the things that um, I lapsed into very easily, and I'm working on this just in my career in my own profession is the importance of networking and, and surrounding yourself with people who are outside of your immediate little nucleus because we we get so focused about what's happening in our program that we forget like there are programs all over the place that are doing different things and just even having the opportunity to look and see even if you're not connected to a person but seeing that they're doing the work can be just as affirming and just as motivating to continue on Mm -hmm. So I think um, that would be my my suggestion, but also just find ways to get plugged in. 
I, I, now I go to conferences and I get people's, I have people's names in my phone. I just have like a first name in the conference where I met them. I don't know. I don't know their last name. <laughs> um, but like, and I'll ask is, is it okay if, if I text you and, and we actually like come to an agreement, like, yeah, sure. And surely enough, somebody that I met at a conference this summer is now texting me like, hang in there, blah, blah, blah. You know, like we're, we're, and I went to this great conference. I'll share the notes with you. Like it's an opportunity to really build some connection that way. And um, I encourage you to just take that leap and, and try to do that because that's how relationships are built. And that's how you can start to also feel the, the confidence in numbers. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Great. I think that's it for now, Tiff. Thank you so, so much. And thank you all for being willing to pop on on a Saturday morning or afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Huge shout out to Luis um, and to Susanna, who did such a wonderful job translating for us. Thank you both so much. And thanks to all of our friends at Alfred Music and my colleagues uh, from SAA who have helped make this happen. Beyond that, hope everyone has a wonderful Saturday. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.